Help me to stand here, Lord, as a mortal. To be able to speak and to say some things that God can be wisely spoken to bring honor and glory to you and edification to your people. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated now. <clears throat> Thank you, brother. <clears throat> when we think of Malachi 4 or 5, and I don't mean to say that, that I want to be a repetitionist. But this whole era of things that's been going on in the last number of years, it starts out with the fact that God was going to fulfill that scripture and has. But then when we turn to Revelations 10, 7, the whole thing winds up in the light of the message he brought. No other preacher, no matter what kind of a revelation he's got, can change the trend of the Bible. That's why it says, In the days of the sounding of the voice, not of Oral Roberts, A. A. Allen, but of the seventh angel messenger. The mystery will be finished. So if we've brought in, been brought into the light of something by the effects of what he said, then it behooves us to stay in the framework. That don't mean that we become repetitionists and that we say, well, the prophet said this, the prophet said this, the Branham said this, the Branham said that. We've got to have a revelation. What did he say? What did it mean? And what does it point us to in scriptures? So we can say, out of the scriptures will come forth everything that's necessary for the completion of the mystery of God, which is how God comes among the Gentiles and through the process of time takes out of them a people that will carry the name. So this morning, brothers and sisters, we're on this subject. The fivefold ministry, what does it do? Now you can't go to the denominational world. You, go, you can't go to the Catholic Church. They don't have no picture of this. They see themselves as being the one and only thing. Well, they are the one and only apostate, pagan system of anti-Christian religion. And then all the other denominations that have through time in the Reformation come derived out of it. God give them people, brothers and sisters, a chance to see light and then walk in the light. Because if we walk in the light, keep walking in, that light will lead to other light and on and on and on. But we find that people stop. It seems that some people's mind becomes limited. They can only just stand so much and then there's where they want to sit down and make camp. But this morning, I'm thankful that God has allowed me, not because I'm worthy, but for some reason out of the multitudes back in the years gone by that was raised in this area, I'm thankful that he allowed me to see a little man. I grew to have great respect for him. I've heard the others. During the period of time that I was beginning to really hunger and search after the things of God, I've heard Oral Roberts, A.A. A. Allen, Velma Gardner, Gordon Lindsay, on and on. I can name them brothers and sisters, and some of them I've done forgot their names. They had a ministry of praying for the sick. God used it in that period of time. But I noticed one thing happened. When a certain time frame came, it just seemed like the anointing stopped. They were no longer traveling the roads with their tents and their campaigns. Those men began to stop and resort to other means. And it wasn't long, one by one. I remember Jack Cole, his testimony. He'd been in the Navy during World War II. He contacted Mullary. When he came home, he was so sick with Mullary, there was a time or two he almost died. But in one of those last episodes of his sickness, his testimony was, God came on the scene and healed him from malaria. Well, he took it then, 
that we didn't need doctors. And everywhere he went praying for the sick, he had some wonderful, successful healings in his meetings. But he just absolutely had no use for a doctor. One well, of the last meetings he had was in Florida. There was a boy that had this terrible polio, little boy. They brought him on the platform, and his legs was in these braces. So he told the mother to take the braces off. They took the braces off. He prayed for the little boy, and the little boy walked. Well, everybody was rejoicing. So they went home that night. But the next morning when the little boy woke up, he could not walk. Jack Cole had threw his crutch, um, his braces away. That's the way, if he prayed for you and you walked with crutches, he would take them and break the crutches up. Well, this started a lawsuit. The parents then went and got a, a lawyer. And a friend of Jack Cole's told him, you better get out of the state of Florida. Well, they lived in Louisiana. So he left Florida, and he went home. But you know, in a few short weeks, Jack Cole fell sick with that same polio. And he died. It, his wife finally gave in and said, we've got to have a doctor. But every doctor they called couldn't do him any good. Now I say that this morning, brothers and sisters. We've had all kinds of ideas through the years. What is divine healing? How does it work? Will God use doctors? Well, let's use the Bible. Let's stop using every person's ideas. I think it's in Jeremiah, about the second chapter. God looks down upon the nation of Israel and sees there is an element of sickness. And through Jeremiah he says, What? Is there no balm in Gilead? That was herbal spice thing that had been used for centuries and it was up when I was a little boy. There was a lot of our medical stuff then had balm of Gilead in it. It was labeled that way. The doctors have left a lot of the herbal types and gone to synthetic stuff. But the reason I used this was, that scripture says, What, is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician that the hurt of my people are healed? Why would God connect it with a doctor? Other places then, he turns right around and rebukes it and sends it the other way. Though they've trusted in the doctors, they've trusted in the bomb of Gilead, and then he warns them, there'll be no healing. Their disobedience, their rebellious attitudes, he won't let nothing affect their conditions. And I'll have to say, brothers and sisters, I've been privileged in life to see a little man. He knew how to use a doctor, and he gave them respect. But then beyond that, brothers and sisters, he knew that it's going to take God to... If, if the means of the medical profession is how God's going to let the healing be brought about, he'll do it. But if it's not, then it means somewhere God has allowed it because he wants to do the work himself. To me, he's the man that absolutely began to set things straight to get a lot of Christian minds straightened up. So I'm standing here this morning, not because I'm worthy, but I saw a little man that made me realize he exemplified the Christian life. He was just as humble and simple. He never went about trying to portray himself as something great. If he met a businessman, he respected him in the profession. If he met a poor farmer, he greeted him, well, how's your crops done? And so on and so forth. So I have to stand here and say, of all the ministers and the preachers since World War II, and I can name them by the carloads, I've heard the doctors of divinity, 
how they used to preach back in the late 40s and the 50s, some of the wonderful radio sermons. I've listened to a lot of them. But then one, in 1952, I was privileged to come in contact with Brother Branham. There was something about the little man, the way he used the Word of God, that made Christ of the Bible just seem to be so large he was no longer stuck in the corner by your denominational theology. He stood out. So brothers and sisters, as we're on this subject, uniting a people, don't never expect a great big explosion. Bingo! Now it's time to have unity. It has to come by a revelation. And when the season comes, it's just like spring of the year. If there's something in your heart and my life and my mind that we have of an understanding of the Word of God, when that season of time comes, it's just like spring of the year. The seeds are already laying there. But when the warmth of that sun begins to shine, it causes that seed to begin to sprout. That seed will respond to that drawing factor of what that sun is projecting down here. And so if we have the right picture in our hearts of what unity is and how it's brought about, we cannot help begin to see something. As I said this yesterday morning, if we go back 2,000 years ago, the unity of the church started with just a small nucleus of people same way here in the end time. This world over, there's thousands and thousands of people in practically all your free nations of the world that have heard about Brother Branham one way or the other, from the negative or the positive. But through these 40 years, brothers and sisters, it seems as though it has stimulated no vision of, well, where is the unity? Where is the completeness of this thing? But I have to say... We are nearing now that pointing. There's going to be unity. And as it starts, brothers and sisters, it's not going to take God five long years to accomplish this. Because in that day of Pentecost, when that Holy Spirit fell in the upper room, it seemed as though they couldn't stay there any longer. That enthusiasm that they've swelled up with, God used it to drive them out of that upper room into the streets. And it wasn't long till it brought a response. And so this morning I have to say, as we're hooked on and around the world, I realize there could be a lot of Branham followers hooked on this morning. If they listen to me, they accuse me of not sticking with the message. Well, I'll say this right back to them. You don't even know what the message is. You can quote word for word, but you don't even know what the man was talking about. Because I'm going to be talking about some things this morning that you'll even deny. So as we're looking at this thing, the unity, we're looking at a body of people. And I have to say, it don't start with the foot or the arm. It starts in the head. Some words in that head realm, there has got to be a particular person, a man. He's got to have a picture of what it's all about. And he's not out here waving a flag, trying to create an interest. But he does have an understanding. So as I stand here this morning, I'll leave all of that up to you. So going back here to the book of Ephesians. This fivefold ministry are men. They're not doctors of divinity. I don't mean that they can't have a college education. But all of that background has nothing to do with the revelation that God will cultivate in their lives. Because when the revelation of the truth comes into their hearts, they begin to see the Word of God from altogether a different standpoint than just the natural education of algebra and so forth. As we come down to these particular words yesterday, from edifying 
unity, the knowledge, and faith. We come this morning where it says, <clears throat> Till we come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect. This means this, this is the only kind of a ministry that's going to complete this work for the Lord. Well, what is perfect? Well, the meaning of the word perfect means it has reached a point, it's finished. But what we see it in the beginning, it means you eliminate everything that's negative, no matter what it is, whether you're talking about something in the material realm, it's always eliminating everything that's negative, not ordained to be a part of the subject or the object. So when we look at it then from the standpoint of the church, it's the removal of carnal minds or the removal of carnal ideas out of people's minds. This begins to deal with our inner being. So saints, I have to say, if you listen to me this morning, don't listen to me from become because of the standpoint of my flesh. A lot of people don't like my person because brothers and sisters, I'll keep my mouth shut till I know what I'm talking about and then when I've said it, don't come around and try to change me. I never intend to speak but once. And that's why I can say through 30 years, 33 years now, we have printed an article called The Contender. It's went around the world and I'm thankful to God we've endeavored to put something in there that's biblical. The reason I say this, I'm not exalting the contender. It's not the Bible. But it does have some messages to point you to the Bible and its meanings. There's a lot of Branham followers throughout the world. They condemn it. Brother Amos know what they've said in Africa. I know those in India have said the same thing. But I've got two different testimonies, especially out of Pennsylvania. This just happened about a year and a half ago. There was a young man. He was in one penitentiary. He was waiting to be transferred to another penitentiary. And while in this first penitentiary, somebody had gave him some of Brother Branham's literature. Well, he became very attracted to it. But then when he found out that he was going to be transferred, he thought, oh my, I hope I can be transferred somewhere where that I can get a hold of some Brother Branham's literature. Well, to his surprise, when he got transferred to this other penitentiary, he had heard through the grapevine about this other young fellow being in this penitentiary. Well, then as he got transferred, he wanted to see this young man. And in the process of time of getting acquainted with him, this young man gave him a contender. Well, he did not know how to look or receive it at first. But the young man told him of a dream that he had had. When that contender was offered to him by another process, Brother Branham came to him with a contender and gave it to him and said, here, continue on in the message. Now, does that mean anything? <laughs> Several years ago, I received a letter from another young man in Africa. In his letter at that time, he told of this, the geological surroundings where he was at when he found this container just sort of away. As he picked it up, he began to thumb through it, but he saw the name of contender and he heard a lot of anti-stuff about it. But he was in a dream. And as he looked at it, and he was in the process of thinking about throwing it away, Brother Branham came walking up to him and said, Don't be afraid. Continue on in the message. Now I have to say, brothers and sisters, Raymond Jackson had nothing to do with instigating that. I have to say, if God is real and God is true, 
He knows exactly how to deal with the hearts of people. So I just speak those things to give honor and praise to Him. God has guided us through the years. So as we look at this word now, perfect, once perfection starts its work, it will gradually eliminate every negative thought in our minds about what we have about this or that. The process is we will wind up saying amen to everything we know that's truth. And these people that want to say, well, I don't think we have to see eye to eye. You will. Because Isaiah 52, 8 is the end subject. Because if the watchman who is the ministry will see eye to eye, you can't be less in the body. Because just as sure as you begin to draw back with anti-feelings and reservations, watch out. God has his own way of eliminating it. So let's look at this word perfect in its final state. It means finished. It's complete. In all respects, it has now become flawless. And God looks upon it with excellence. Because he's put it together by the workings of his spirit. It's not Raymond Jackson going to put it together. It's God going to put it together. But I believe, brothers and sisters, if I can have the mind of God, he'll help me to say the right things. That will put the thoughts in the minds of people. So as we look at this thing, as we begin to move with a, a, towards the progress... This body isn't just coming out of America. It's got to come out of every Christianized element of society around the world. It's sad to say in a lot of places there will be hardships. And there will be a lot of agony. And I have to believe, brothers and sisters, God knows exactly how to cause something to reach in them areas and draw those people out. As we continue on down to here... As I said yesterday morning, Peter was the main spokesman on the day of Pentecost. Nobody else wanted to rise up and contest him for it. As the body collectively began to grow, then if you read through the book of Acts, you begin to see the conditions, the necessity of other things, the other ministry begin to become identified. Here comes the prophets. You can ask, well, Brother Jackson, where is the New Testament prophets? You leave that up to God. Because he started with that apostles first. And time and the growth of the body brought necessity. And all of a sudden, here they are looking at you. You see them written. It's going to be the same way, brothers and sisters. You and I, we do not walk the road of life. Now you do this and you be this and you be that and such. That's not it at all. It's God. But he will absolutely start with the right framework, the right revelation. And you don't start with the voice of a committee. You'll start with the voice of one. That voice of one is up to you to decide, well, who is he? It's not for me. I'm him. I'll never say that. But I have stood for something, other brothers and sisters. And I can look back and I have to say, God has honored it. So you make up your mind. Been a lot of people through the years, brothers and sisters, for a period of time they would come and walk with me. But after a while, for some reason, they get another idea. They want to walk another direction. Well, they went. Well, I didn't buy them. So I have to say this morning, Raymond Jackson didn't redeem you. Jesus Christ did with the shedding of his blood. But I'm praying, brothers and sisters, that God has put something in my heart that is a truth, that it can become a picture to unfold, and God can activate it in our lives so that we can all grow and progress by it. So as the body begins to more become functionable, you're going to see the gifts of the Spirit begin to really show themselves how they will function for the, <clears throat> the sake of the body. It's true, brothers and sisters, since the day of Pentecost, back at the turn of the century, 
Gifts of the Spirit have been used by the Spirit of God. They've been in men's ministries, in groups of people. God had His purpose in different denominations and things. I don't condemn what was said and everything. It goes to show that God was in the process of restoring into accessibility the necessity of these things. But when the time comes that there's got to be a church, not churches, with different revelations, with different foundations, with different headquarters. We can't expect the Spirit of God is going to be in every one of them, confirming everything. He would be the author of confusion, wouldn't he? So I believe that the final thing is, he's narrowing it all down, where he's going to bring everything right into a final state, and for a short period of time, as the people that really are to make up his true body, really begin to see what unity is, God will set in order those things. Necessity many times causes God to bring on these things. In the book of Acts we can see when certain controversies begin to rise. In that day wherever Paul went, Barnabas went, or any of the other apostles. Here would come that other bunch of characters, legalistics, law, circumcision, this and this and that. One time when Paul and Barnabas, they've been, been gone. They come back to Antioch. Well, they've seen this congregation is all disturbed, confused. They're at one another's throat, all because... Some brethren from Jerusalem had came and said they were sent by the elders. That's just like some men in this area used to be. I come from Branham's church and I come from Branham's this and Branham that. But God have mercy, they went everywhere teaching everything. So, <clears throat> here Paul and them found them. And these men had told the Antioch, unless you be circumcised after the manner of the Jews, you can't be saved. So Paul and Barnabas, they head for Jerusalem. Now the Jewish church has grown. It's got a multiple of type of people. Ministries have come up. And so when they're down there, we find out. Here's Judas and Silas. What does it say they are? They're prophets. So it was not Judas and Silas that laid out the terms. It was James and them that began to get their heads together and says, This is what we will say. The Gentiles is not required to meet this kind of conditions. You know what it says in the book of Acts. So when Paul and them left there, Judas and Silas went with them. What were they? New Testament prophets. That don't mean they pastored congregation, but they were just men of the congregation of Jerusalem. But they had an understanding and a revelation of what truth was. So they went along with Paul back to Antioch. And it says, and they confirmed, bore witness. And I have to believe, brothers and sisters, that there was those times when God would open the mouths of these men and they would prophesy or maybe they'd say, we had a vision or a dream last night. There was another man by this time, by the name of Agabus. He's only referred to twice. But I don't believe, brothers and sisters, that twice in the book of Acts meant that's all he ever did. I believe that as long as he lived and functioned within the realm of Christendom, God used him periodically here and there to speak and say things that would edify the people. It did not make him a pastor. But it made him an, an instrument that God could speak through him in a prophetic way or by a vision or dream to confirm the fact. And all of this edified the church and the people moved on. So when we talk about brothers and sisters, we're beginning to move towards perfection. We're getting close then to the body where it's beginning to now. The impurities, the negative stuffs begin to fade in the background. But we come on down the line here. 
from perfect <clears throat> perfect man unto the measure of the statue. What does the word statue mean? We are to become the statue of the fullness of Christ. It's not Christ here in his personal body. As he was, he was the fullness of God, lived among mankind. But as God is allowed to restore his church, then the church does become the fullness of Christ in all of those characteristics that the life we live is absolutely a replica of the life of Christ. That the world about us will say, well, there's one thing sure. No matter where you live, where you come from, God will make that man of the world say, them people know how to live for the Lord. We don't have to walk the streets carrying a play card. I'm a Christian. I'm a this and that. It's just the life you live. As we begin to grow more into the statue. Now let us take this word statue. I will read first what it means. It says, an expected height. And this is using this as an illustration. In that of size. Or as that which is required. So then we transfer that into the spiritual sense. God in his own mind knows exactly what this statue of the church is to become like. You know we had in this area and in New York and different places back in early days after Brother Branham was taken over the scene and the things that periodically find here and there after he had preached the seals. There was two brothers in New York named Hunt and Coleman. They're both black brothers. I knew them well. But they were just like many of the other Branhamites. They wanted to excel and exceed. Well, they, for some reason or other, they took the idea, all seven seals has been broken. And says, we'll find it somewhere where it's written. Well, it wasn't long, brothers and sisters. They find, they come out with the idea. It's the statue of a perfect man. And they take it from the epistle of Peter. We grow in knowledge and this and this and this. So they're saying, that seventh seal brings us into the statue of the perfect man. The seven stages. Brothers and sisters, nothing could be any more foolisher than that. Because you know and I know them first four seals was all talking about the Antichrist. How can you go from Antichrist to something other like that? It don't work that way. So we have to understand. And they will never accept it any different. That seventh seal never was broke. He spoke on it, but he never did say what it was because God would not let him. And I have to say, Look how long it's been. He brought that revelation of those six seals in 1963. Well, that's been 41 years ago. And therefore, that seventh seal is still in the program of God. It cannot be for the religious world because you could go to any denomination there is. They're not even interested in those subjects. They don't see those subjects. They don't even have a revelation. And yet they've got Dr. DeHaan, I mean, John Hagee, a Baptist. He's preaching certain prophetic signs, and brothers and sisters, he's as far from that as the moon is from Jupiter. God will not let that denominational world be able to tap in to the deep things of God. But when we think, brothers and sisters, a statue, by it we will say, if we're dealing with a man under the ordinary eyes of reason, it's in the plan of God that a man's statue will reach a certain dimensional height and dimension and weight. Well, I am not the one that's going to determine, well, what's the statue of the church? It's God who looks at the statue of the church. 
All we can do is do our part. That while it grows collectively, in unity, harmony, we become absolutely more and more in our characteristics and the life we live, like unto the life of Christ. It is God himself sees how big this thing is going to be. And therefore, time will stay here as long as necessary for the church to grow into that statue. Only God will know when to press the stopwatch. So as we've come into that word statue, then we come, brothers and sisters, to the last word. And that is we find, brothers and sisters, I, would, I will continue on from this word statue here. Paul says this, that we henceforth. Now where is Paul at? He's in jail. What good's his letters written in jail? Well, your life and my life still being affected by it. But he knew by that time from in 64 AD that the church then was 30 some years old as it started among the Jews and now it's come to the Gentiles. And as he goes on here, because he knows as we're converted out of paganism, out of the world, out of tradition, and that's what a lot of us have been converted out of, tradition, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You know there's preachers today, they just delight going around with a new revelation. I want to say this. For several years after we built here in 67, every convention we had, we always had these Branham followers coming in the doors with their books. They've sat in here, brothers and sisters, with their arms loaded with quotes, just waiting for an opportunity to get a chance to say something. Well, you know, it got almost worse disgusting. It looked like nobody could get up and give a word of testimony. Here, one of them would pop up. It got where you felt like you'd just like to have a good beetle dog. Unlike you do a rabbit, just sick the beetle dog onto them. I was a nature brother. Per I never wanted to absolutely be contrary to anybody. But something just began to get a hold of me. You're going to have to stop being this soft-spoken little old country boy and start looking them in the face and telling them what's what. And that's where I come up with the old saying. You don't tie my shoes and you don't butter my bread. So why don't you just take you a nice long walk? And I don't care if I never see you again. I know what the prophet said. But now tell me what he meant. And if you can't tell me what he meant by having some common sense with it, get out of here with it. It's nothing but junk. I would rather listen to some of these denominational men than some of these Branham followers. And they're still running the roads today. They come out here once in a while, brothers and sisters, when we're in convention. And if you go, when you go out your car, you'll find one of their little old tracks stuck under your windshield wiper. They like to harass. Well, I'm not going out here and follow around anybody and harass them. But I absolutely say, I will stay in my own corner, I will mind my own business, and I don't ask nobody to come or go. But I have to say, Lord, you bring the people. I'll do my best to present truth. And I want to present an image, a truth, that people can look at and make up their minds. If you want to be part of it, that's your choice. So this word measure, we continue on reading. But speaking the truth in love <clears throat> may grow up into him in all things, which the head, and here we come right back, which is the head, even Christ. And brothers and sisters, if all these five-fold ministries, we will say, are the invisible head in one sense of the word. It means that Christ is going to use every one of them offices to speak his thoughts through. 
Those men are absolutely going to be guided and directed to speak nothing but the truth. And that's why I said yesterday morning, these different callings are much like the medical profession. I can say something. I mean well in saying it. But that don't mean that you have understood what I've said it in the way I would bring it out. But let somebody else come along whose calling is different. His ability to handle it is different. He'll be able to take that thing and put it into such a simple way. And you'll say, well, my, that's wonderful. And that's why I have to say, it's going to take the calling of all five of these offices. In the plan of God it will. One man ain't going to finish it. One man ain't going to perfect it. One man is not going to add all these attributes. But there's going to be one voice started. And I'll have to say, well, now you're bragging, Brother Jackson. No, I'm not. I'm just speaking the truth. I've been shot at so much, brothers and sisters. I told Perry Green one time, I said, I feel like an old horse that had been driving through a cockerbur field. I got so many cockerburs in my tail, it don't hurt no more. Now, how many knows what I mean? I say that for a means of illustration. You get to the place, brothers and sisters, you realize it's God going to guide you and direct you. Let them yak all they want to. I'm going to stand for a truth that I see that's so simple. I don't ask for a name. But I'll leave it all up in the hand of God. So as we continue on. So as God <clears throat> deals with the church, bringing it all down to its final stages, weeding out all these imperfect ideas, getting our minds where we're we're single-minded now. We're looking straight ahead. We're in love with one another. We really see each other with the proper attitude. Yes, it's that invisible head as he manifests himself in and through the ministry from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure. This literally means every individual, sooner or later, no matter how little or how big, the Holy Spirit will do something in and through that life that will speak out. And that absolutely will be based upon the measure of the Spirit that that person has received. For He has gave to us, every one of us, grace according to the measure. He does not give us more than we need. He does not give us short of what we need. He gives us exactly what we need. It is up to us, brothers and sisters, to see this and recognize it. And then to say, God, you just help me to function and be just the little fellow in the body. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, this is the way God will look at His church. From the least to the, what we will say, the biggest. But when he looks at his church, he sees it collectively. And he knows exactly how to use each little individual to add to something to that body of believers according to that measure of faith. Every part worketh. Every part maketh the increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And I can look back through the years, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> when I was first brought in in relationship to Brother Brandon's teachings back in 1952 just coming out of a Methodist church I never would have thought that God would have had in mind of me being able to see anything but when I heard Brother Brandon begin to talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues the gifts of the Spirit over and over have I heard him say, the gifts of the Spirit will be restored to the church. Well, brothers and sisters, I begin to pray that, Lord, you just help me. And I know after I had received the Holy Spirit, I did not speak in tongues at that time. And that's why I find it hard many times to know how to answer somebody that comes on and wants me to speak well it's a visible evidence 
Well, brothers and sisters, speaking in tongues in the apostolic hour was a sign. It had to be because it took that, brothers and sisters, to fulfill a prophecy. But I want to show you something. Speaking in tongues was never quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost. Here's 120 speaking in other dialects. When the question was asked by all this multitude in the streets, what is this? We hear the wonderful words of life or the words of God spoken to us in the language whereunto we were born. Well, Peter picks it up. This is that which was spoken by Joel. Second chapter. Joel didn't say anything about speaking in tongues. Joel said this, Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Old men shall dream dreams, young men shall see visions. And upon your handmaidens and servants will I not pour out my spirit. So Joel had no nothing in there about tongues, did it? But then Peter says it's that. But it took Paul years later when he's writing a correction to the Corinthian church. And you'll find it in the 13th chapter. That the speaking in unknown tongues or languages was what God said through Isaiah 28, 9, 10, and 11. For with stammering lips and men of other tongues will he speak unto this people. And that's what he was doing on the day of Pentecost. He was fulfilling that prophecy and it was never even fulfilled. Not even quoted on the day of Pentecost. You can't even find it. So the point is this, brothers and sisters. It was a sign. Because it was appointed, brothers and sisters, to be that as a proof. But then when we come among the Gentiles, then they turn right around and they want to say, well, this is the initial. Now when you deal with the initial, that means the one and only. So I'm saying, brothers and sisters, it's not the one and only. Because when you go over into the book of Acts in about the 19th chapter, and Paul finds certain disciples then at Ephesus, what did he do? They were converts of Apollos. And he asked them then, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, We know not whether there be such a thing. He said, Then what were you in baptizing to? And when they told him, he took every one of them out and rebaptized them in the name of the Lord. And when he did, they spoke in tongues and uh, prophesied. There's two manifestations, isn't there? And that's how I have to say, brothers and sisters, through this last 100 years, in many places where the Holy Spirit has fell, prophecy has been spoken just as much as tongues. And I'll say this, you get out there and mix around in that charismatic realm, and you'll find a lot of this stuff is going on. So the point is this, why do we get hung up on an evidence? Why don't we just say it's a sign and let the evidence be in the hand of God because he knows the heart. He knows the mind. Here's a fellow can be under the anointing and he can speak in tongues and God knows that's his spirit. Here's another character over here, brothers and sisters. He's speaking in tongues. Three weeks later, he's running around with another man's wife. Now tell me it's the evidence. How I many knows what I'm talking about? Let's get it straight. Because if you don't, you're going to get hung up in the mud hole somewhere. Because we've got to get back according to the Word of God. So therefore, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> now I want to deal with a little something other here. As the church collectively grows in size, in all of these other qualities, we're going to find, brothers and sisters, that the gifts of the Spirit are going to be a necessity. After God spoke to me in 1955 to start the church, we started it down here in a little place in New Albany on State Street in a little old big old garage building. But this was long about March and April in 1959. God sent up the advances through the area and this message, this Revival at that we had at that time lasted for three weeks. And I've seen people, there wasn't many of us, but I've seen people, brothers and sisters, collapse on the floor, lay there under the power of God. They prophesied, they spoke in tongues. And we had several 
that received that kind of a supernatural experience. But I've noticed this, brothers and sisters, over the process of months that followed, especially one particular man and his wife, they came out of the Methodist Church at Georgetown. At that time, they were a nice couple. They had ni two nice sons. Well, I just felt like my... Now they've received the Holy Spirit. It ain't going to be long. They're going to be part of our congregation. Well, they come to the little mission where we was at for about six weeks. And then all of a sudden, the devil goes to working on their heartstrings. And we heard the word said, the husband and the wife begin to communicate among themselves and say, you know, I don't believe we're ready to yet leave the Methodist church. So they went back. If God ever gives you light on something, and you come out and you taste of that, and you even dare to start drawing back and going back on God, you won't stay together. Because they no sooner started going back to the assemblies of God. Something happened in that them two. They become antagonistic toward each other. And in a year's time, they became divorced. It like to drove the man crazy. Then their children grew up in that atmosphere. Then it wasn't long the oldest son. He got to dabbling around in dope. It wasn't long here his name was in the paper he had been arrested and put in jail. I say those things, brothers and sisters, and through the years of time I have watched this happen in many areas. Not the same example, but when God brings you out of darkness into light, and for some reason or other, you're not yet ready to pay the price, and you try to go back on God, He'll either take something away from you, or he will destroy you. Because he's not going to let you come into something other than a taste of it. We had another young man. During all that meeting. How he had laid, laid under the power of God and prophesied. And my you would have thought this young man is, de is determined to be a child of God. Over the process of months. Not all of a sudden. I can see he is beginning to get dis less interested. Within a year and a half time, he's done dropped out of the congregation. I heard that he's not going to church nowhere. And one day, a brother of the congregation, he's dead and gone now. He was over in Louisville, and he's coming back across the 2nd Street Bridge, and he saw this young man walking on the sidewalk part. He was dressed like a hippie. And his hair was growing right long. And he said he was walking along there. He said he just looked like a bum. So when God brings you into the light of something and an experience, and for some reason you dare to go back on God, He'll let you destroy yourself. Because you will not take that blessing and walk around in life playing with it being what you want to be. It don't work that way. So this morning, brothers and sisters, after that meeting was over, we moved from there. God had added to the congregation a quite number of people. We came over here in Clarksville into another building. And it was there, brothers and sisters, through them about three and a half years that we was there, God constantly would visit us with an anointing. At that time, there was individuals out of the Branham Tabernacle begin to come to our meetings. The gifts of the Spirit begin to be activated. And there was about two or three individuals from the Tabernacle. They begin, into, they begin to get into this with us. So I'm, I'm telling you this, brothers and sisters, because it's going to lead me to say something. Not to degrade anybody. But when God brings you into the realm of the gifts of the Spirit, Spirit, please, for goodness sakes, don't think that gift is going to be taken by you and you use it like money. That gift belongs to God. 
but he's choose to exemplify it in and through you. They were several from the tabernacle will come, so they got to giving messages in tongues and so forth. At that time, Brother Armand Neville, now I'm speaking and I, re I, I realize there's probably some Branhamites on. Well, you listen to me. He heard about all of this. Well, he really began to seek God. It wasn't long till God visited him with the gift of prophecy. He got to prophesying. As he did, <clears throat> then it wasn't long till individuals would go up to the front and he would prophesy to this one. If he prophesied to one, three more would get up. And it wouldn't be long he would be prophesying to them. This went on for several weeks. It wasn't long, brothers and sisters, they was keeping a tape of every prophecy. They were printing it out. Individuals was carrying around little books with prophecies that he had spoken to them. Brother Armand Neville had an old store building in Henryville. He opened it up for a prayer meeting on a Saturday night. And there was different fellows associated with the tabernacle. On one Saturday night, he would have me, and another Saturday night, he'd have somebody else. Well, it just so happened on this particular Saturday night, I got up there. <clears throat> As I drove up in front of the building, it wasn't time for service to start, but I noticed Brother Branham's vehicle was parked there. And directly out of the building came Brother Branham and Brother Neville. Well, I was still sitting in my car. Well, as Brother Branham's come walking across the street, he reckoned, I'm, Oh, Brother Judy, come here. Well, I got out of the car and walked back over there. And he said to Brother Neville, let's walk back in the building. So we walked back in the building. He said, Brother Judy, I believe that God visited Brother Neville and gave him a real gift. But people got to pulling on him. And they got to pull in prophecies. Brother Branham had been in his cave up here, fasting and praying. And the Lord told Brother Neville, I told Brother Branham, go tell Brother Neville, I put a gift in his life, but that gift is not to be used as everybody comes in prayer line. So, brother, right there in front of me, brother Branham told me. He'd already told him, but he's repeating it. I was a personal witness. Brother Neville said, and I thank Brother Branham for coming and telling me the truth. And so I said, well, Brother Branham, I pray that God will help me to never allow people to pull on me for something other that's not there. Correction was made, but it wasn't, brothers and sisters, three months. Brother Neville got to go into the prayer room then. Certain individuals was following in the prayer room. And in the prayer room, he starts prophesying again. Same individuals, same motivation. I need another prophecy. You need another prophecy like you do a kick in the seat of the pants. There's nobody needs the Spirit of God to speak to them dozens of times. And so when that was going on, <clears throat> we begin to hear about same individuals always wanting another message. Here they go, here they go. So as time went on, with some other things that was going on then in the church, there was another young man, not a young man, but an old man. He would come into faith assembly, and then he would go into the tabernacle. You could not say, stand in prayer and bingo, he's going to come on with a message of tongues. 
This goes on, on and on and on for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. Until finally, brothers and sisters, we come at the end of 1963. And that's when Brother Branham had a board meeting, and that's when he made church order. And when he made church order, brothers and sisters, he did not make church order to change anything in the Bible. He made it to correct something out of order that was bringing reproach, not only on his name, but on the message and upon themselves. And no sooner, brothers and sisters, had that been made and was played on New Year's night. Every preacher, Tom, Dick, and Harry, from Canada to Mexico, called in the tabernacle. Well, it was good enough for the tabernacle, it's good enough for me. And brother, here went church order. And brother, it has brought havoc and ruin. And when Brother Branham, brothers and sisters, was on his way back here, in December of 1965, he left Tucson. He called the George Wright family and said, I'm coming back to do two things. To preach the trail of the serpent and to take out church order. They were very good friends of ours. So they phoned us and said, Brother Jackson, Brother Jackson, Brother Branham is coming back to do two things. To take out church order and to preach the trail of the serpent. But he never lived to come get back and change it. So church order stays there. And that's why, brothers and sisters, for the last 40 years, they have shipped me from Timbuktu to here and there. Because I knew the inside story, I knew the inside connections. And some of the very men on the board that remember what was made, they're gone now. One in particular who lived right next door to him. He left the tabernacle, he went right over to Louisville, and he picked up the largest assemblies of God over there. And I have to say, why was it that you had to live next door to him when he was alive? But then when God took the man, he took your enthusiasm. So you went right back to the old religious world. So I'm saying these things this morning, brothers and sisters, is the right way to look at anything. And don't never think that I haven't seen some things. I have. Heavenly Father, take the words that I've said today. Help us, Lord, as your children. And I pray that these words, Lord, can be wisely and rightly understood. Lord, that we will know exactly how to put them into activity that it can affect our lives and that we can really truly be a part of your body. Lord, I want to be a part of that body that we can live and function and fellowship and that we can reflect you, Lord. I pray now, Lord, bless my brothers and sisters in here. Guide us, Lord, through the days to come now because, Lord, we know you're going to put a people together. From the ends of the earth, Lord, they will hear the truth. They will know the truth. They will respond to truth. And Lord, you will lead those people. And now, Lord, I pray, take these words and glorify yourself in your people now. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.